pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> Welcome to another month of Third Thursdays here at the JKC Gallery, where we showcase two extraordinary photographers every month. Um, this month, it's no exception. I'm going to hand it over to my partner, Heather, and she's going to introduce <laughs> the new artist we have this month. Um, well, Habib and I have chosen two um, incredible Philadelphia-based artists. We have Krista Smolanis and Eddie. Oh, goodness, I'm going to butcher your last name. Ben <laughs> ben That's okay. Yeah, he goes by Eddie Elux on Instagram. <laughs> the hyphenated. I should have practiced. I'm, I apologize. I'm embarrassed now. <laughs> um, but both of them are working in two uh, completely different processes. I think that you'll both... I um, think that all of you will really enjoy both of them. Um, I've learned not to say too, too much about their artwork because they're, of course, going to present about it. Um, but I think we'll be able to have an interesting conversation today about humanity um, and culture through uh, portraits. Um, Eddie does portraits and Krista's work is mostly based in architecture and space. Um, like relative space, not outer space, <laughs> um, which you will see more of. Um, the galaxy. So I'm very interested to hear what they have to say. Um, Krista is going to be presenting first, and then Eddie will be going after. We're going to do Q&A at the end, as always. And a reminder to type into the chat box if you have any questions while they're presenting. We'll be able to get to them at the end. Um, so Krista, if you are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen. Yes. Um... It's gonna be like a little uh, behind the curtain for a moment here. <laughs> There's so. no more behind the curtain. It's all on screen now. Okay, got it. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. And then presenter, and we're back to here. Yes, don't think we are. Sorry, there we go. Okay, perfect. It's gonna just take me a little, little second there. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so I am super excited to be here. Big thank you to Heather for inviting me to speak about my work. Um, so I'm just gonna get right to that. So even though I am formally trained as a, as a photographer, I've um, worked in an interdisciplinary matter for a, a long time. So that's combining painting, sculpture, installation, some of that you're seeing on this first slide. Um, and that's definitely colored the way that I approach photography. Uh, but I'm not really going to talk too much about um, that other medium. I'm gonna be specifically talking about my photographic work. So I'm gonna give you a, just a really quick overview of some uh, two older series, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more in depth about uh, two projects that I've been working on for the past about five, six years. Okay, so uh, in general, my work has dealt with ideas of home, migration, a sense of place, um, and architecture's role in defining some of those ideas. And this really, this interest really stems from a personal family history. So both of my parents um, were World War II refugees that ended up in the US um, from the Baltic countries of Latvia and Lithuania. So they spent about five years as children in uh, Germany in these displaced person camps. And that has definitely uh, shifted the narrative of my work and um, kind of focused me onto these ideas of home, place, and uh, sense of place. So the image that you're seeing here is an older body of work. It is called uh, Migrants. And this body really focused on my own personal migration throughout the United States. So typically I tend to um, photograph my surroundings constantly. It's a way for me to understand my physical self in the space. So I'm always uh, photographing my home and the surroundings around my home. Um, and so I had a very, to me, very large uh, move to Chicago in about 2014. I was an East Coaster for a long time before that. Um, happy to be an East Coaster again. Uh, <laughs> No, no offense against Chicago, if there are Chicago people on here, I do love Chicago too. But um, so in that move, 
uh, I started taking this repository of images that I had taken um, in the three places that um, I had lived in the short span about five years. So Chicago, New York, um, and rural Pennsylvania. So I started printing them out, cutting them apart, creating these collages, talking about memory, space, home, again, my own sort of travel and migration um, in these spaces. So I was really interested in distorting the viewer's perspective, kind of having these floating architectural forms and playing with this idea of generating something three-dimensional in a two-dimensional space. So it only felt natural that I actually bridge it out into three-dimensional space. So as that series progressed, I started working three-dimensionally. Um, and so these are, again, images of New York, um, Pennsylvania, and Chicago that are printed on aluminum. They're CNC routed. And then there are these custom um, wooden structures that are built underneath them that kind of jut the photographs out into different planes of space. They're, they're wall-mounted pieces. So I'm gonna talk about the, the two projects that I've been working on for quite a length of time, for about five, six years. But before I go really uh, deep into those, I just wanna give a little bit of a historical background about it. Um, so there were about 200 displaced person camps in Germany shortly after World War II. And um, the reason being is uh, in 1941, under Soviet occupation, Stalin gave the order for 132,000 mass deportations of the Baltic countries' edu educated citizens to be sent to Siberia, essentially to perish. So once they were in Siberia, there was very little food, um, little shelter, and extreme climate conditions. So in most cases, many of these uh, people died. So in 1942, when the Germans under Hitler's command gained control of the Baltic countries, they essentially halted a much larger deportation plan that um, had existed. And so the paperwork from that plan um, began to be disse disseminated to the Baltic people. So people learned that whole families uh, were listed on these lists to be the next people to be deported. So in 1944, when the Soviet army came again um, to the doorstep of the Baltic countries, these individuals decided that they, they had to flee and they had to leave their, their homeland. So they fled in, uh, you know, however they could. This is a, um, an archive image of that. So their uh, horse and buggy trains, um, boats, any way that they could, they could leave the country. Um, and they knew that they had to go west. They had to go towards Germany. So once in Germany, when uh, the Allied forces had divided Germany up into the British sector, the American zone, and the French zone, there were these displaced person camps or refugee camps created for um, individuals. And so this is just a map that shows some of the displaced person camps that were particularly for Baltic individuals. So um, these camps, they were rustic, meager dwellings of all types. So they were former army barracks, um, hospitals, empty buildings, partially bombed buildings. In several cases, they were former forced labor camps actually. Um, spaces were tight, cramped. They often lacked heat. This is an inside of one of um, the camps in Kempton in Bavaria. So this is where my journey began in this um, project into these archives. So the town names are very well known in the Baltic community, but exact addresses are not. And there's no address database to figure out where these camps were. So I spent a lot of time kind of going through very many archives across the, the US, some in Germany, digging through these old 75 uh, year old paperwork to try to find some kind of idea of where these camps were located. So if I came across you know, some kind of piece of mail like this with a little hint of an address that was gold, um, I also found some camp plans in the UN archives. And anytime I found any kind of address or a camp plan 
I was immediately going to Google Earth to try to figure out, you know, whether these buildings were still existing, um, if the address was located near a railroad station or outside of a main central part of town, because most of these camps were, were in those kind of locations. And then when I was in Germany, I had a whole repository of, again, from various archives, um, of images from that time period of these camps. And so I used that to make sure that I was indeed photographing the correct buildings. So there's a lot of time spent in really looking at the buildings and counting the floors and the windows and you know, really making sure that I was photographing um, the right spaces and I was in the right place. So this is an image of what was the former school during uh, refugee times in Hanau, Germany, right outside of uh, Frankfurt. And this is an image of Würzburg um, displaced person camp. So you'll see there's an eagle statue uh, over here. Oh, well, you can see my cursor, yes. And then there is also um, a statue of a soldier on the other side. And both of those still remain. This is my current image of that space. You can still see the eagle statue is there. Interestingly enough, when I photographed this place in 2016, um, there were Syrian refugees that were uh, in, inhabiting that space. Hmm. So in the process of figuring out where these places were, I came across a large number of these plea letters that the refugees were sending to the United States government, um, Canadian government, and also the UK asking for asylum. So they're basically explaining that they could not go back home. They would be seen as enemies of state. Um, so they needed to find a home elsewhere. So I have been taking the text from those letters and then quite literally burning them into uh, the images, my images of those displaced person camps. And so uh, these images are entirely made of text. Um, they're uh, printed photographs, and then I take them through a laser cutting process and I laser cut into them this text. And so this is uh, also another image. This is um, Bayreuth uh, DB camp in Germany. There is a double layer process with some of these images. So they look a little three-dimensional here to you and that is because there's two different layers that um, are kind of playing off each other, which create that three-dimensional uh, space. So the top layer is entirely cut of text and the bottom layer is uh, partially cut of text to create that play of three dimensions. And then there are, sorry, I just lost my cursor. All right. And then there are um, also images in this series that are a uh, single layer and partially cut with text. So it feels like the building is disappearing or evaporating or appearing, depending on how you think about history. And this is a close up of that right there. That same image um, that was in Blomberg, um, Germany. And then just to give you a little behind the scenes, this is the laser at work with one of my pieces. So I create very intricate text files that I program the laser to cut. Um, it is a negotiation. Technology does not always play nicely. So um, I try to make the laser do what I want it to do, but it also has its own programming. So I kind of like try to have it not do what it wants to do. Um, so uh, it's a little, a little bit of a little bit of a trick to do that. Um, at the same time, or uh, about two years ago, um, the other half of this project has been traveling North America. So I've been traveling the US and Canada, finding refugees who are housed in these uh, camps, and I go to their home, I take their portrait, and I record their oral history of migration. So this is the first portrait I took. This is my dad. These are, <laughs> these are the Vavritskas and they were in um, Oldenburg and Hamburg uh, displaced person camp. 
And this is Brigitte Foldatz. She was in Bayreuth DP camp. And then when the pandemic hit, um, I started making this work, which has a similar related history. So at the time that I was going to Germany and documenting these displaced person camps, I was also going to the Baltic countries and documenting these Soviet buildings that were erected during Soviet occupation. And so I've been pairing the, those buildings with traditional textile patterns, traditional folk textile patterns, um, again, through a process of laser cutting. And so the reason being is there was a very concerted effort during that time um, to create one homogeneous Soviet culture and to really eradicate any sense of individuality um, of, the, of the cultures and countries that the Soviet Union had usurped. And so um, keeping these folk traditions alive and doing processes like this was really seen as a political form of resistance. And these are all buildings uh, in Lithuania and um, all textile patterns relating to Lithuanian textiles. I get a lot of questions about where these textiles are used and they're used typically in tablecloths or curtains, um, scarves, gloves, all sorts of things like that. And then this is my ending slide. So that's, um, that's my website. That's my contact information. Um, just want to thank everybody for learning a little bit more about my work. That was amazing. Oh my goodness. Right. After seeing them on the wall at Unique, it's so great to hear more about the whole process. I'm so enthralled by it. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. So awesome. thank you for sharing. I'm just going to do one thing real quick. Okay. I'm sorry that I had my name on your face the whole time there. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'm going to read. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. All right. All right, Eddie, are you all set? Yeah, pretty much. Go ahead. Share. Can you change the camera? <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> all right. Well, let's. Yes. It was on Krista the whole time Eddie was talking, yes. <laughs> Do the desktop rights then. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to full screen. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. And I want to thank Habib and Heather for having, having uh, me here today. It's an honor to be welcomed into this, this great community and to be able to present today. So thank you for that, this opportunity. Um, I'm going to talk about, just introduce myself, talk about a series from Cuba that I did in 2016. Um, that was an important experience for me as like an emerging photographer and and then I'm going to speak about about a series to in Ukraine actually that where my friend lived for almost three years and talk a little bit about our experiences there. And then I will show a little bit of his work just to provide some context. Um, so I entered uh, photography through a little camera like this. <laughs> um, it's called the Roly 35 millimeter and actually it's from my uh, grandfather passed down to my mother, who's joining today. Hello, mom. Um, <laughs> and I started making photographs with it and fell in love with the process of black and white photography, you know, waiting to receive the images. It became a really special experience for me and I fell in love. Uh, it opened my eyes to art and kind of changed the way I look at the world. Uh, and going through this process, I was like, I need to get a digital camera to keep up with the modern age. And I got, a, I got a digital camera and went off to Cuba in March of 2016. And inspired by my friend who I'm gonna talk a lot about tonight, Chris, who basically held me accountable to wanting to go there myself uh, for four months. And there was no real plan other than to make images and get to know people and really see and feel what the country was like myself rather than reading about it or 
you know, just looking at it in the news, uh, I really wanted to actually be there and experience it myself. And photography became an amazing way for me to interpret the world, interact with the world, uh, create images and put a frame on the world and show people and share what I'm seeing and just enjoying in the, you know, the aesthetics of, of light and shadow and form and all these great things that we all love. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump into our slideshow and the images are, you know, I'm going to let them speak for themselves mostly. Um, to provide a little context, this series is from my very, the, the, the very end of my stay in Cuba in July, uh, traveling to Santiago de Cuba, which is on the eastern side or the Orient, um, where Fidel Castro attacked the Moncada ba uh, barracks in 1953. It's a city where, you know, there was a lot of energy and um, this was a festival where I met a Cuban Haitian folkloric group. And so without further, yeah, I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> <laughs> so I traveled from Havana to Santiago and basically it was a big family, uh, aunts and uncles and grandmothers, you know, kids. Uh, and I was along for the ride. <laughs> For me, the biggest impact, I think, of these people in the series and this whole experience was the joy that they had. And uh, the, I put up a small exhibition of printed photographs at a small gallery called A Seed on Diamond Gallery. Uh, it's run by Betsy Casanas and other amazing Latinx artists in Philadelphia. And I was able to share some of, these, some of this work, but it was called La Pura Alegria de la Belle Creole. And Belle Creole means beautiful Creole in Creole. <clears throat> and in Cuba, I felt like there was this permission to just be who you are. Some, in, in a lot of ways, barriers were dropped. Um, egos, you know, were kind of dropped. Um, There's a feeling of solidarity and, and acceptance that I actually hadn't felt really elsewhere. Uh, and I was just thrown in the mix. And th this was this experience was just the, literally the first afternoon that I arrived and we were in a dorm, uh, an art school, you know, dorm facility. And there were so many people in there on bunk beds and, you know, it was quite the experience being welcomed in like, like that. They were just practicing, playing for, you know, for fun. And so music, of course, was a big draw for me uh, in terms of what I like to photograph. I really do like to photograph musicians and uh, creative work in motion. Uh, and the series is a, has a lot of candids, you know, moments that from, from just being there and observing. It's called Tio. He was 86 years old and strong as a bull. <laughs> So a lot of their performances are storytelling and in the Cuban, you know, Haitian Caribbean tradition and in the parade, right? And with all the, the, the outfits and costume changes, I mean, they're working on low budgets here and it's just one big party. And something I learned, you know, for, for Cubans, if there's a party, they're happy. <laughs> I was happy too. And there was respect from the children who were performing all the way up to the grandmothers and the seniors, the elders who were singing and leading the troops. So much emotion. This was the image for the show card. Uh, it was a young man, 14 years old, believe it or not. And he just had so much life and he, he's almost like looking into his, his future here <laughs> in my mind. So I'm gonna pick up the pace just a little bit. <laughs> So 
So my experience has brought me to a number of events, uh, cultural events, lectures. There was so much going on in, around the city. Uh, and this is in a valley, uh, valley that had, was, had copper in it. It was called La Cobre. And there was a, an event going on to honor a Cimarron who was a, uh, basically a, a slave that was brought over and escaped into the hills, um, you know, kind of like representing the maroon communities. But he lived up in these hills by himself. And so this guy's like a, a figure of a shamanic figure, kind of channeling his, his spirit. And in Cuba, there was so much mystery for me, you know, and I didn't need to know everything that was going on. And I think photography is an amazing way to explore and discover new things rather than answering questions, really asking questions with the photographs. And this was a print that I made very large. Um, the five by seven print that I hung, hung on the wall. So for me, this fire, I don't know, this fire was an interesting moment to capture and re representing the Cimarron who was a shapeshifter could turn into animals and, you know, represented this natural freedom, kind of anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, just free. And so in Spanish, it says, mi futuro está en mi raíz, which means my future is in my roots, and my roots are a cimarron. <laughs> Some graffiti and art that was nearby the site we were. And this was another site of a uh, like a sacrifice in a musical event with bata drums, which are sacred drums in the Afro-Cuban uh, Santeria tradition, uh, honoring Yemaya, which is an Orisha that represents like the salt waters. So I would love to spend more time looking at each photo. I just also want to maintain our time here. We're good. Yeah, you're good. So here it says Carnival de Haiti, La Belle Creole de Camagüey. Bonito Patois. And you see both black and white in color. Happy to talk about this at some point if anyone has any questions. I like including both of them, uh, and I think they serve different purposes, and happy to explore why. Yeah, so my process, um, as a, I really draw into documentary photography, photojournalism, what's happening in front of me. Um, sometimes I don't have a plan necessarily of what I'm looking for. I mean, I, I've learned from mentors, it's, it's really good to have an idea of what you are looking for. I think in addition to that, so much comes with the subconscious as artists and what we read, what we see influences what we do and, what, and how we look at the world, how we perceive it. And, you know, the, the beautiful thing is looking at your photos and be able to curate them and finding meaning and stories throughout them and then living with them and seeing how it changes and informs you, I think is really what it's all about. Um, so there, there's two fire photos. The one, the big fire you saw is a different uh, fire photo. This is, is at the very end, and they burn, they, they burn uh, the Diablo, you know, mm -hmm. came out of Diablo to burning all their sins as like a way to wrap up the festival and to kind of, yeah, bring it to a close. And so then I was able to tra travel with, uh, to Camagüey with <clears throat> this group that I got to know, and this uh, photo you see up in this uh, photo is a portrait of the grandmother who was like the cultural leader of this group and who had died, I think, three years previous. So her daughter was was carrying on the tradition and it was very meaningful for me to be able to kind of come full circle with them and even join them on the ride back with the bus. I have a tripod that's made out of carbon fiber that's still somewhere in that city <laughs> that I hope to go back and get one day. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that I have a lot more photos of Cuba and, and I just wanted to share this series as it was a meaningful time, a week that I spent with them and really impacted me and showing me like importance of joy um, and, and living and 
you know. Anyhow, I'm going to transition now to some work on Ukraine. I don't know how much time I have, but just we're working through it here. <laughs> for good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me. So I'm going to jump into a uh, basically a gallery show that I put together in 2019 at a small gallery in um, Germantown called the Imperfect Gallery. Uh, love my people over there. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this full screen. Uh, this is uh, in honor of my friend Christopher Allen and dedication to him. He was a journalist working in Ukraine for over three years and living in Kiev, the capital city, which we have you know come to learn so much about in, re in recent months now. And I visited him in 2017 from March to April. And he was reporting on the front line there, covering the war since the beginning of 2014, since he uh, visited Maidan, you know, this famous square in Kiev, Kiev where a number of revolutions have happened. And so here we're in his, uh, his, in his apartment, and I'm going to take you through the show that I, I basically printed out. And for me, this is this this show is really an explore, exp, uh, an exploration of our friendship, uh, our relationship through photography, and being in a, in a city together and exploring a few new places throughout Ukraine, and you know connecting over this visual medium. And and this this photo is in Germantown. It's in a abandoned building that we explored together. And so when I started looking at these photos. Um, and especially more impacted uh, after his death, he was killed actually in action doing his work in South Sudan, reporting on the civil war there in August uh, 26th of 2017. So the photos that I made while in Kyiv took on a lot more significance and going through the photos, which you know, I'm gonna continue to go through now, um, were really a way for me to process my grief and also celebrate our friendship and to maintain this experience that we had together, essentially. And this spiral is in a crematorium that he suggested, talking about architecture, uh, really beautiful, amazing architecture in Ukraine, Soviet architecture included, <laughs> that he was so fascinated by. And so this is a photo of us in the clock tower. Keep going here. Also, um, a number of themes that I can't help but come into contact with which which is the image and what is left after one dies. Uh, and this is actually taken in a cemetery in Lviv in the western side of Ukraine. And there's so many images of people on gravestones. And this is clearly an older one um, that I made with my, my smartphone that I printed out and put in the show. And for me, it's a question of like, what even if we make photographs, they start to fade, they start to break, you know, so what, what does it mean? Uh, this is a photo made by Christopher Allen. And we were sitting across from one another and these are the first you know, two photos you see when you walk in. So now we're walking in the gallery, take you around. <laughs> So there's a little fun time-lapse experiment going down um, Arsenalna, which is one of the deepest subway stations, metro stations in the world. Um, and being on the world-class subway system in, in Ukraine and Kyiv was like almost, almost better than New York, honestly. Um, and it takes on greater significance in a wartime when people are literally down there trying to survive and avoid shelling and getting shot at. Beautiful tile work, uh, just architecture down in these metro systems, pretty amazing. Some of my first moments getting off the plane in Kyiv, actually, I believe, <laughs> when I arrived. This is Chris walking in Venezia, Ukraine, which is the site of Werewolf, which is actually a site of Hitler's Eastern Front. Uh, I had an underground bunker that went down eight stories, and they have not excavated it till date. And so it was a sunny day, it was eerie walking around the site of, you know, a, a headquarters for, for Hitler during World War II. <clears throat> I 
And there was a Mexican photographer that I was influenced by. She was talking about how birds represent death or like from the you know, release of death. So I was joking with Chris about uh, pigeons being a trope of street photographers and always, you know, showing up in different ways. And we were joking about it. And I was, of course, running into pigeons in the city of Lviv, walking around by myself, making photos of pigeons flying around. But this photo became an important kind of symbol for me especially now with the spirits in Ukraine that are, you know, being, that are transitioning in other parts of the world too, due to conflict and war. And this was a World War II monument with Joyce's mother. Uh, so some context, I traveled to Ukraine again in 2018 with his parents after he, you know, was killed in South Sudan. We revisited uh, Kiev and we were, we were in his apartment with his uh, roommate Sava. And it was a hard, difficult journey, but we went to the Carpathian Mountains and were able to explore some of the spiritual area, climb some mountains. <laughs> I also was able to go to uh, Krakow, uh, Poland, and visit Auschwitz and Birkenau, the Nazi death camps, and that had a big impact on my trip there. And I think this whole show, honestly, um, reminding you know, us of what happened 75 years ago. So this is in the square, uh, Raniak Square in Krakow. And they also straddle digital and analog. So photos you're seeing are both uh, 35 millimeter uh, negatives, silver gelatin, you know, and as well as uh, some digital work. Again, in the Lviv Cemetery, a year later, another spiral. And these photos would all be displayed, you know, in line, in order as I'm going through them intentionally. I believe that's in a market in Lutsk, Ukraine. So a lot of the photos, I, I'm coming constantly in contact with death. You know, cemeteries are, you know, a reminder of it. But for me, they're also a very peaceful space. I love exploring cemeteries and, and I'll talk more about it. Um, this is Joyce's, his, Chris's mother uh, lighting a candle in a church in Lviv. This is in Lviv as well. Just every day, you know, every day kind of things. And my mentor noticed that this could be a symbol for life and work, you know, coming home from work and your groceries in the other hand, kind of this balance that we all are dealing with constantly. And there's a lot of photos that I'm, are not shown here. Uh, there's a procession of little children dressed in white with a priest with a big, you know, staff and very dramatic and uh, all they were holding all these heart balloons and it was just a kind of poetic moment for me. Some people say, oh, it's not a great photograph. I'm like, well, sometimes photos I think serve other purposes uh, in, in a narrative. And this spoke to me for some reason. So it's, it's, in, it's in here. <laughs> Look at that architecture, yeah. This is a hotel in Kyiv, so I had to include it. <laughs> In front of the Opera House in Lviv, I learned a lot from um, a photographer named Sean Theodore about the power of silhouettes in photography, and I've been obsessed with them ever since. <laughs> Sometimes you see one artist or photographer and they open your eyes to a whole world that you never could have imagined really visually. Again, this is Joyce, uh, Chris's mother in Kyiv overlooking like the Dnipro River. And this, yeah, I was on a day honoring like World War II veterans or people from Ukraine involved or in Europe. So there's all these flowers stacked, like mounds of flowers. This is back in the Carpathian Mountains. And one detail, I don't know if we can zoom in here, but 
there's spirals on this towel that I noticed way later when I was looking at these photos and printed this one out pretty large. So that was a nice moment to have it kind of in there. I call this the spirit of the Carpathians. And Chris uh, skied in this area. He visited this area and skied um, on these mountains in the winter. So we were retracing his footsteps in some ways and creating a new relationship with the space. And a lot of these <clears throat> photos are speaking to our, our journey uh, going through grief, you know, through loss, climbing figurative and literal mountains and understanding, you know, what it, what it means to lose someone who's so big and so important in our lives and, and retracing his footsteps and honoring, you know, his life and what he brought to me as a friend and also to the world and why he was, why we came to the, you know, what brought us to the Carpathians. It was really him and his journeys and his desires to scatter his ashes um, in the Carpathians if he were to be killed. Uh, he sent a document to me that I, um, that we have, and he, that's what, that was his wish. So we were going to the Carpathians to see what we came into contact with. And it was a very spiritual journey, um, which some of these photos speak to, I think. Keep going. <laughs> And in the foreground is his father, John, who's from England, who's British, and Joyce in the green in the background is looking at the camera. He's Armenian. Uh, she's Armenian-American. So his family is very global, and I think that, that really rubbed off on me. And Chris and I, we you know, connected over, over travel. So we're getting through it. We're almost, to, we're almost there. So this is uh, pictured outside a, uh, another metro in Kyiv. The juxtaposition. Some, some so this is on my way to the um, death camps in Auschwitz. Uh, sorry, in Poland, in Krakow, going, you know, taking the trip out in a small van to the countryside. And this is in Krakow as well. But one of my favorite color photos, I think, that I've made. Kind of reminds me of Alex Webb a little bit, speaking of influences slash, you know, spatial <laughs> stuff. So some of the fountains, one fountain photos you're going to see are in Maidan in the central square in Kyiv. Again, the site of many revolutions over history, not just recently. And this was near the end of my trip. I'm sorry, this is near the end of my trip um, in 2018 with his parents. Again, we're back in the Lviv Cemetery. I often think of a Prost quote uh, that's paired with this photo. I don't think, I don't know it right now, but basically it speaks to what's left after we're gone, the smells, the personal affects, memories, you know, what we can remember, feel, hear, touch, see. And this is outside Birkenau, like the weeping willow, just mourning, continuing to mourn, I think, the, the, the violent and difficult history that is, that is here. Um, this is another powerful image that's looking down into a Kiev metro. And I just, I saw this light and this, this young girl coming and it's just, it's that, you know, she's angelic, right? With her white stockings and those bright white shoes. <laughs> Sending the staircase. Yeah. This is my friend, Chris. I call this the champion. <laughs> And this is part of the sign that's entering, entering Auschwitz as Albert Mach frei, which means work will set you free, roughly. Right? So some dark themes, you know, present, I think, in these photos, too, considering the balance of life and death and living, you know, uh, just living daily in your lives, showing daily life. 
Uh, and this is the show card I wanted. This is a celebration and brings me great joy. Uh, it shows like the fountain of youth, right? And these kids were standing there just interacting with the fountain in such a beautiful way. It's like they were, you know, like pretending that they were giving life to the fountain or playing with it. And for me, this just represents the playfulness and, and the vitality of life that we have and in a place right now that we are seeing so much destruction and, you know, difficult images. Um, and it's especially difficult for me, I think, um, dealing with it as someone who's been there, but also having a friend who's called this place home. Um, this is the crematorium, a few more shots to paint it a little bit. It's one selfie of us <laughs> traveling, writing, photographing. Um, oh yeah, this is a collage I made with it, or just a, like a little worksheet I made of Chris, this is Christopher Allen's images. Um, you can see Maidan on the top left, just to see where the fountain is, is the same square. If you were to look all the way here, the fountain is on this side with that hotel in the background. So I just wanted to show this is in 2014, um, how this was a war zone and, you know, and there's a lot of confusion, a lot of, um, you know, movement uh, with operatives moving that are unmarked and violence and people, you know, with snipers getting shot. And it's, he was right in the middle of it. Um, and he was left his university to go to be in the square. And I just feel it's important to share a few of his images that he has seen throughout his time reporting and living in Ukraine um, with soldiers on the front lines, being with them. Um, and also some religious events like this one right here. I think it's a cool photo. And then this is the, my process of printing out photographs and ordering them and understanding how they're all going to fit together, like back in that same year that he was he was killed. And my big props to my mentor, Michael Kaler, who has taught me almost everything I know, practically. <laughs> and he works at Germantown Friends and is a great photographer and artist. I uh, would love to talk more about him. And I just think this is an important thing. This is at Auschwitz. Um, so even going off your presentation and experiences that you've, your parents have gone through and people are continuing to go through now as refugees, like I think it's so important not to forget what we've been through as, you know, humans <laughs> and not, and yeah, exactly, to not to be condemned to repeat it. Uh, and I think that's why photographs are so important to record history and to show what has gone on, what has been there. And um, this is a, a portrait that, uh, that was in Lviv. And the reason I just wanted to tie it through is because Chris got a photo of me making that image, which is always a fun thing for me, playful, a photograph um, showing the perspectives that it takes. And having someone to have your back and to you know, photograph you as photographers, you don't always get photographed. So that's one beautiful thing that we do have. Um, and that's it, that was a show card. Uh, so I know we're probably running up on time. I, I do have a few more photos that I would like to share. Uh, so there's only 11 um, of a series he did on the front line. So if we're okay if I could share them. I would like, I, I, honor, I have, uh, I appreciate this time that you're providing because I have to carry his photos and show them since he's not here to show them for himself. I think they are very relevant in this time period that we are right now. And I just wanted to show some of what he was seeing back in 2016 near the Eastern Front uh, of the Donbass region that we we're also hearing so much about. So he was a developing photographer and really started, I think, hone in on his own style. And as we're learning, the Eastern Front is a lot, you know, very expansive, a lot of fields rolling countryside and he basically lived with these people for a long time weeks at a time and we go back to kiev and we'd be going back to brussels and belgium and then coming back to the front line so really living this like almost bipolar life <laughs> of being in an absurd world and back in civilization you know and now the war has been brought to kiev and everything has been flipped on its head So a grenade sitting with cute children's toys, just, it's just hard to like reconcile, you know?
So yeah, there's some active firing happening, I think, in this photo, and that's the, I don't know, that wasn't the last one. Yeah. Okay, I believe we are almost there. So yeah, so that, that's it. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share some of Chris's work in addition to showing my work from Ukraine as it helps to, I think, bridge this gap of what was going on in the Eastern Front since 2014, it's been simmering since 2018, and now we are in the present and it's full in our face. And so I, um, I want to hold time for questions and answers, so I really appreciate you guys having me here and being able to. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. That was amazing. And I think the two of you have more connections in your work than I originally yeah. realized. Yeah, wow. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah, amazing. Any questions from any of the viewers? Yeah. my question you can ask him <laughs> yeah ask why don't you guys can ask each other questions um so have you heard from chris's family are they still in the ukraine um i was about to meet myself yeah so chris chris is american british he was born in uh, philadelphia so he was he's from he's from here he's i grew into high school with him maybe something i left out uh but his his effective family uh in ukraine his friends and other journalists and People that he, you know, came into contact with are doing well as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they've been very busy, you know, just dealing with a war zone. And uh, there's a guy named Chris Ojikoni who I'll give him a shout out. He's been doing a really a lot of amazing work uh, covering hospitals and you know other other parts of this war that's going on and. So yeah, there, there's people that are there. His his roommate is doing is doing well. So we are, you know, constantly monitoring. But it's stressful, you know. It's definitely stressful uh, being in contact with people who are in an active war zone, mm -hmm. and and it's been a hard thing for me to be dealing with, you know, over the past few few months and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But thank you for asking. Yeah. I actually, speaking of getting in touch with people, um, Krista, you were mentioning how hard it was to find records of addresses. Is it equally as hard for you to find records of uh, people that were in those camps with your parents? No. Oh, really? Interesting. <laughs> no. Um, actually, I find a lot of people through Facebook. Oh. So, um, so there are a lot of uh, Facebook groups that are for, you know, Baltic heritage, you know, Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian. Um, and then I'll post on them that I'm looking for individuals who are in these camps. And although probably the individuals who are in these camps are not on Facebook, but their families are. Okay. And so I will often get, you know, granddaughters, grandchildren, sons, daughters saying, my parents were there. Mm -hmm. Let me talk to them. They need to be part of your project. Um, so, yeah. So I've, I guess that's one thing that I, I, I didn't note. Um, so I finished interviewing and photographing about a hundred former Baltic refugees. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I was wondering how many. Yeah. And you had like a really cute, like smile on your face when you mentioned the first couple. Did you have a good story about them? You seem to really connect with them. Oh, um, you were I like, just, oh, I just, this is these people. And you were so happy. And I was like, I, I wanted to hear more. I connect with all of them. <laughs> In fact, like, this is just a, this is a funny thing that, um, you know, my husband, he goes and he does all the audio recordings, um, and video. So we're like a tag team doing this. Um, and inevitably, you know, there are people that I've never met before. Um, and then we go into their home and they're a little bit concerned. They're like, who are, who are these people? What are they going to do? Where is this, where are these photographs going to be? Um, but then, you know, they'll warm up to us, we'll talk to them. And then by the end of it, we're always having some kind of drink and they're like, next time you come, you need to stay over. You need to stay there. You know, they're always offering like their spare bedroom or something like that for us to stay. Um, and so that couple is, they actually I think my husband still talks about it, that, that they gave us like an amazing dinner. They cooked an amazing dinner for mm. us. And so he still raves about that dinner. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, yeah, it's really, really great moments. Yeah. Nice. nice. Oh, we do have some questions in the chat. They're starting to come. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to gloss over all the uh, wonderful comments first. Um, Gary from Gary Soretsky. Hey, Gary. 
for both photographers, what do you think you will be doing five years from now? Sounds like an interview. It's, it, that's what I was gonna say, I'm like the interview question. <laughs> Well, so that, that's a great question, and I'll, I'll, first, I'll just take it quickly and then pass it on. Um, yeah, my mentor always always reminds me what we're doing right now is going to impact where we are five years from now. Not to make you nervous or not to make me nervous or anything, but it, it really is an important thing to be thinking about because it's like, what am I putting into motion right now that are planting seeds that may grow in ways I'm not even aware of in five years? You know, taking some intention with it. But uh, for me, I really am falling more into photojournalism. I, I, I want to push myself in that direction and see other parts of the world and, and learn about traditions and peoples and to be in touch with, with people's stories myself, again, rather than like reading about it or getting it from secondary sources. So the photograph is a document in itself. It's an interaction and I, I want to be the one making it and learning from people directly. And then being able to share that with 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 my world and um so i don't know we'll see it's nebulous but i want to be uh doing doing more portraiture work more documentary work possibly making documentaries yeah. good plan that's awesome <laughs> yeah. um, so young -ish. <laughs> yeah so i uh have had this project in mind for, for some time now. Um, and I don't actually know, I'm hoping, I was really hoping that I would be able to kind of do it sooner than later, but now with what's going on um, in Europe, that's probably not likely. So um, another family backstory. So a, a, lot of, a lot of this history is gonna be unfolding out for me um, in future projects. And so there's a story about, um, it, during uh, occupation, so when the um, Soviet army came in, there were the individuals that basically became guerrilla fighters. They were known as the Forest Brothers. So they hid in the forest and, and kind of uh, strove to defeat uh, the Soviets. Um, of course, that, that didn't happen, but they, they did try very hard. And my grandmother's brother was part of that group. Um, and eventually he was sent to Siberia where he died. And so I have been for a while wanting to go to Siberia and find some of these um, former uh, forced labor camps and, and places where these individuals were sent and kind of document the one that uh, my grandmother's brother was in. Yeah. That's a, that's a noble goal. Oh, that's intense. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You've done so much amazing work. Wow. So have you. <laughs> so I have one question from Jose. Hello. Nice to have you here. Thanks for joining. Um, so the question is, can you talk more about the black and white process you mentioned earlier? The black and white image of the lady carrying her bags backlit by the sun was very nice. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the black and white process. So at the darkroom and the analog process has been really important for me in terms of getting to know photography uh, as it forces you to slow down and be much more intentional with the images that you're creating. And so it taught me about all the technical parts of photography but also the darkroom itself as a process is something that I miss that I'm, I wanna get back into, you know, get back in the darkroom and luckily the Halide project in Philly, shout out to them has developed a, dark, uh, a darkroom that is open for people. I think it's opening very soon, if not open already. So I'm excited to check it out and, and start printing more. I worked with a master printer up in Allentown named Dave Haas, who he, he prints for like Larry Fink and has printed for Joseph Rodriguez, another important influence. Jamel Shabazz, he hasn't printed for Jamel Shabazz, but Jamel is an important influence on me as well. And he's like social photographers uh, has shown the importance of living with your images, just as you live with the subjects that you're working with to get to know them, building relationships and how meaningful that is. And another big uh, person has been Gordon Parks has been a big influence for me over the past few months. Reading A Weapon of Choice is, a, is an amazing book that, yeah. That teaches a lot. So, the the darkroom process and black and white has was immensely important for me in my initial stage of photography. Just getting to know light, shadow, you know, form, motion. It kind of distills uh, something where color I feel like distracts a little bit. Uh, I think color can be used intentionally very well, and that's how I think about it. You know, how, how what are colors doing? Just like what are other elements in your photographs doing? 
because we all make choices when we photograph and a lot of it's in our subconscious, I think we're not even aware of it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful to have worked with the printer to print out a lot of the silver gelatin prints for the show that I had and seeing the print in its final form, like we're in a gallery right now surrounded by these images, uh, that, that's, that's the ultimate end of photography or creating sculptures with them, which is amazing or architectural works. Bringing them into the physical is, yeah. I think, you know, the most important with, with photography. Mm -hmm. That was my summary. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I think those are all the questions. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get some awesome. closing uh, closing <laughs> remarks, guys? <laughs> this is a great show. This, this is a great show. Thank you again to both of the amazing guests that the both of the amazing guests that we have. I'm sorry about that, guys. <laughs> amazing show um, every month. Um, continue to be inspired by the artists that we have. Um, shit, I feel like I have a couple of questions. I just haven't like tapped into um, your process with the laser printer. I actually um, do research on all the guests that we have, believe it or not, all right? <laughs> but I was looking at your website and before I could continue, I started looking at some of your work, your recent project. I just shut my laptop. I said, okay, I can't wait to meet her in person. The laser printer, the installation, just as far as the 3D sculptures that's on the walls, I feel like I need to see your work in person. So if you can tell our audience any galleries that your work is showing at anything at the moment, or where can we see your work in the future, both of you guys also? Yeah, thank you. I, um, I get that a lot because it is so um, object oriented, the work that I make. And so it's very hard to kind of translate it a screen. Uh, it really has to be kind of seen in person. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I have any U.S. shows coming up. All my shows are coming up in Europe this summer. Let's travel. So yeah, if, if <laughs> anyone's <laughs> going to the, the Copenhagen Photo Festival, I'll be there. So, um, uh, so yeah, I think the U.S. I have U.S. shows coming up in in Los Angeles next year. Um, and then also in the Midwest next year. And then I will, I, I am going to have something here. Yeah, we're, gonna, um, we're just going to have to have a show here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah which will be awesome. Then I'll definitely tell, tell everybody about that. <laughs> yeah, right um, now there's a small effort actually uh, in Germantown where I live to do 12 by 12 inch panels that are it's kind of, kind of like an open call. And I think it's going to be ongoing. So we're just producing some small works at uh, the Germantown Espresso Bar. People can look them up on Instagram, just Germantown Espresso Bar. And uh, there'll be some work up there. And I hope to have at least one square that they're raising money to send to Ukraine uh, to support, That's great. you know, probably uh, like medical supplies or like uh, supplies for children there. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So some art for, art for good. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. I might I might submit so yeah you gotta might, come out to Germantown again uh, my <laughs> end, and also sue me if I do anything with my prints in the future and laser printing all right that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's like no, that's, only Chris is allowed to laser print <laughs> yeah seriously yeah. I, might, yeah. I might just do the frame or something like that but that's really cool in the substance in both of your works I feel like we did a great job yeah these, Absolutely. both of these artists up because it yeah. seemed like it was the same story, just different chapters. It was, it was awesome. That, I, it yeah. was an amazing show. That's definitely. definitely true. I felt like that too. And both yeah, you guys are amazing. out of Philly, you know, representing Philadelphia. So that's awesome. Yeah, like that's that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank um, and thank, thank you to everyone yeah. at home for, for coming. Yeah. So we'll um those of you who have to go, thank you again. Thanks for coming. Uh, I hope to see some of you uh, either here on Zoom on Saturday, and uh, if not, uh, next third Thursday. It just looks uh, up. It's May nineteenth. Yes, May nineteenth is the next third Thursday. Yeah, with Wendell White and Aaron Turner. Oh yeah, we have Wendell White and Aaron Turner. So come on. Exciting. <laughs> yeah. wow. um, that'll be the last one of the season. Too, I know. So. We're closing wow. out on yeah. a high note. So yeah. thank you all for being here. We'll see you next month. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. See you later. <laughs> I'm <laughs> <laughs>